I'm hoping that as we enter into this message, my uh, statistical odds of getting words pronounced correctly uh, will be better now that we're sort of swinging in a British direction as opposed to a French direction. Uh, but I've, I've gotten some good feedback from people on some mispronounced words, and I just want to say thank you. Uh, thank you all for helping me with my mispronunciations, which is just part of, again, it should be the humor of this series and not the serious tone where we have to get distracted by it. But uh, I think the most humorous, though, is that I have an entire message that I called the, uh, well, I forgot what it was, the inexorable force, right? And so then someone comes up to me afterwards and goes, by the way, it's inex inexorable. So here I am, the one word I should get, which is an English word, I get wrong. And I, could, I still didn't believe it, so I was like, what? I mean, I've, I've said inexorable my entire life, which is a scary thought when you think that through. Uh, and uh, so then I looked it up, and I could not. But you know how you look and you want to see some other, you know, you like go to a few, you know, people saying it. They, okay, the British way. That must, I must say it British, because, you know, I'm sort of like that, right? And sure enough, they, I was mispronouncing it. So even the title of one of my messages I've mispronounced. So that's just part of the humor. Uh, which hopefully that doesn't distract you, but only enhances your uh, experience with World War I. This is part eight, and it's called The Old Contemptibles. Uh, it's a fun, fun title. It fits. It's really good. If you, if you know British history, then you sort of smile at this. That's a, that's a British uh, label and title. And so this is where it comes from. We're calling uh, Kaiser Wilhelm II, uh, William II, and he's the uh, Kaiser, the Caesar, the, the Tsar, the uh, king, the emperor, whatever the term would be that makes sense to you, over Germany at the time. And he is going to, as he's sending off his troops, or he's giving a commission to his uh, German troops that are going to run into the British uh, that are just arriving uh, in France and headed up towards Belgium, he is going to supposedly say, exterminate the treacherous English and walk over General French's contemptible little army. Now here's what's a little confusing. We have the French and we have the British, but the general over the French, uh, I'm sorry, the general over the British operations, his name is French, and, uh, not to be confused. And the irony is he doesn't like the French. His name is French and he doesn't like the French, right? But uh, his name's John French. And so this is, this is the quote, exterminate the treacherous English and walk over General French's contemptible little army. And so you can just imagine how the British would respond when they hear something like that, right? They're going to say contemptible, huh? And so every one of the, the BEF, the original uh, British expeditionary forces that are going to cross the English Channel, head into France to strike against the Germans, the ones that survive, which isn't very many, are going to call themselves the old contemptibles. Uh, and so that reminds me uh, about something. You can, you can just sort of see how that inverse motivation works. It's like, you're going to call us contemptible, right? We'll show you contemptible, right? Now, here's what's funny. There is no evidence that, he, that William ever said this quote. No one has any evidence, but you know how those things go, don't you? The British are convinced he said it, and that's all they need. They just need to have the thought that he said it, because it fits him, doesn't it? William would say something like that. And so I, if I remember correctly, something in politics a few years ago, I, I think one politician called another group the deplorables or deplorables uh, if they would think of voting for this other uh, politician and then that whole other group called themselves the deplorables very happily. It's sort of similar. And so if you survive the regime currently, then you will be called the old deplorables uh, sometime soon. <clears throat> so the old contemptibles, there's a few remaining. 70,000 go over. Uh, there are not going to be many that are going to uh, survive out of this. And yet, as the years passed, the old contemptibles would still gather together. But it's an amazing thought to think that the British armed force, the British military, wasn't made up of like an infantry. Uh, it was made up primarily of naval power. If you're an island, why would you have a big standing army? And so, and they didn't. They had 70,000. And when you think about what is marching into Belgium from Germany, you remember it was like, you know, estimated 1.2, but 1 million to 1.2 million troops just coming into Belgium. And guess who's coming across the channel to meet them? 70,000 
British troops. Now, that's going to join with the French, but the French aren't expecting that much to the north. Remember where France is putting its emphasis? It's putting it in Alsace-Lorraine. And so we have ourselves a mismatch here. And the, the, the British troops are walking right into it. I mean, this is like one of those legendary stories for the British because it's the David Goliath type of story, which they've played up throughout history. And it is a good story. It's called the Battle of uh, Mons. So the Battle of Mons, August 23rd, 1914, one of the challenges with World War I is it's hard to get an action shot, if that makes sense, because, you know, it takes a long time. You sort of sit there with the camera and let it, you know, uh, you know so the, the people would just you know, pose in front of it for a while. And every now and then, you know, the photography was developing at this time, no pun intended, but it was getting better and better. So we do have black and white, and we do have some moving pictures, which look really funny. You know, it's just, it's not to the normal uh, metrics of human movement. Uh, but it's hard to get a good action shot. Uh, but, and especially the Battle of Mons, most of this territory was so devastated because of the artillery fire. It's hard to even wrap your mind around what it looked like when it started. And uh, it was a factory town or a mining town, and so they had all these what are called slag heaps uh, around, which I have no idea. They call them like witches' caps. Uh, and so it's just all around, sort of disgusting, the way it's described, sort of a sludgy, dark uh, town. And the British are marching, and they're in a good mood, and they're going to run into the brick wall of the Germans. So just to give you an idea, here's that map, uh, which I have uh, put up on the screen quite a few times, so hopefully you guys are going to become experts in European landscape from 1914 uh, by the time we're done with this. But you see the, uh, the, the purplish red colored uh, countries, that's going to be the central powers. Germany is the key initiator or the aggressor in this war so far. And that's like at the very top of that color scheme, you see that horse's head uh, type of look. And Germany is going to make its initial move uh, by moving towards Belgium. I put a star there where Mons is. So you're going to get this idea of how far into this battle that, that whole sledgehammer movement is coming in through Belgium, and then it's going to swing down into France to Paris. And so the United Kingdom is going to be mobilized, and that's a whole story in itself that I have somewhat downplayed. But the crisis for the French is that the, they, don't, they have an agreement with Great Britain that if they are ever in certain situations... The, the British will come to their aid. But it's hard to define if they're in that situation. And so the British are sort of holding off, and that's partly because they have a civil war in their own country. Not, a, not an actual civil war, but sort of like what we have politically today, where the two sides are so opposite that they cannot talk. And to the point where you're really struggling for any ability to unite. And when you're dealing with going to war, you sort of need a united government. And so this is a big deal. The French need the British at their flank. They need them to cover what they promised to cover. And the Brits are like, We're, we didn't actually promise that. We didn't actually say that. Uh, it's an understanding, not a treaty. And they're right, but still, you know, the French are like, the word of a, a Brit is mud if you don't do it. And so you have this tension and... Obviously, I'm saying that the, the British are going to mobilize and they're going to come into this war. You're hearing that. So they are going to act, but there's a lot of tension in this that I'm sort of skipping over. And the Brits are going to come over and they're going to end up carrying the left flank, the, the far left side of the entire military defense of France, which is not a very pleasant place to be because that's the key point where most of the weight is coming down. So the British are coming in out of nowhere, showing up in this theater of war with 70,000 men, and suddenly they're going to be struck just in the Battle of Mons with three times their numbers, just in that one location. The readiness for war. The main focus I want in this one, when we talk about the old contemptibles, is this idea of what I'm going to call the readiness for war. Now, many of you may have a negative perspective of going off to war, and you would never fight, you'd never carry a gun. That's possible, okay? In a group like this, we have a very mixed gathering of 
Christian background here. And you have a lot in the sliding scale of perspective. You have what would be called non-resistance, which is like, no, I, I can't even touch a gun. I mean, I would never even get close to that. To the other side, where it's like, do you have a gun? I could clean it for you. I could also shoot it for you. In other words, you have this gamut, right? And it's a tough one to say where the, you know, how the morality plays out in that because it's sort of what you're doing with that gun. The gun itself is an amoral instrument. It doesn't have a morality to it, but it's how you are using it. What are you using? Are you using it with the flesh as its instinctive, uh, you know, the impulse behind it? Or is this something different? Is this a movement of the Holy Spirit? And some of you say, there's no way that the Holy Spirit would work through a gun, okay? Now, I, I can understand that Jesus is going to come in Revelation 21 with swords protruding out of his mouth, and I'm, I have a hunch we'd probably say the same. There's no way the Holy Spirit could work through a sword. And yet, if you go through the landscape of the Bible, you're going to recognize that there is sort of a time and a place for a sword. However, I'm not going to argue with those of you that are like, I don't think that's the normal Christian behavior. And you would be correct, right? So it's a tension. The tension over war and how we in, engage with it is a unique one. What I want to focus on is not physical warfare, that if we went to war against Russia right now, for instance, what are you going to do? That isn't necessarily my question. We're in a war. You're already in a war against the powers of darkness. What are you going to do? Or maybe I should say it this way. What should you do? Because most of us do not truly understand the nature of the life that we have been commissioned to. When you enter into the kingdom of heaven, you are immediately enlisted in a military operation. Whether you want to be or not, it's like one of those countries that once, you know, as a guy, you turn 18 and you're immediately enlisted into the military in that country, and you have to serve at least, you know, three years. You're like, what? Give me a choice in the matter. That's the same thing you could say about the kingdom of heaven. Give me a choice in the matter. Your choice was to come to Jesus, and when you come to Jesus, you are immediately at odds with the system of this world, and you must understand your weaponry. You must understand how to fight this battle. This battle is not against flesh and blood, as you would think. It is against something different. It's against a different layering, a layering of uh, powers and authorities that you can't see with your naked eye, but you need to be ready to engage with that enemy. Do you remember the illustration? And so on, for Daily Thunder listeners, you weren't here for it. It was a very great uh, illustration, very fun. I think it was after a Daily Thunder. But I had Stephen uh, stand up. Do you guys remember that? And I said, Stephen, could you stand up? And then I came up to him and shoved him. It was very rude on my part, I have to admit. But it was sort of fun. Uh, and Stephen went flying back into his chair, a little chagrined and embarrassed, you know, because as guys, you don't like to be shoved, nor do you want to fall back into your chair in front of a whole audience, right? So I apologized, and I think he forgave me, uh, too. Oh, <laughs> he has a big heart for me. And so then I had him stand up again, which he was a little, you know, wary of. And then I said, okay, let's do that again. Now imagine you knew I was going to shove you, because the reason he's going to fall back is he's unaware that he's about to be shoved. But what if he was aware that he was going to be shoved? And that's the Bible for you. In other words, God's saying, you're about to be shoved. So if you know you're about to be shoved, you change your position. And you get into a position that can take a shove. And that is precisely what we need as the body of Christ. In our soul, the devil, the devil is about to shove you. I can guarantee you it, guys. This is how it works. Anyone who lives godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution, will be shoved. So what is your posture and position? I'm not asking you if you're willing to carry a gun over to Russia. That isn't the question. Are you willing to utilize the weapons of your warfare in the spiritual sense that are not earthly, they're not carnal, they're spiritual, to engage this enemy to win? And that is the key question that I want to bring up in this. And of course, that question has to come up when you do a series called Spiritual Lessons from World War I. It's like, what is the good of a series like this unless you start touching on the war that we are in? Unless you're applying it spiritually? Because I mean, this is just a bunch of hard news to take when you start studying World War I. It's like, what is edifying about that unless it is useful to us to groom us for battle? The readiness for war. So we're going to at least have a couple quotes from this guy, John Lucy. And he was actually part of, he's, he's an old contemptible, okay? So he actually is going to write his memoirs afterwards. He's going to survive, right? 
and very fascinating character from Ireland, and his stories are very interesting. It's a very unique perspective, but the one thing you're going to get out of it is that he is ready for war. In fact, not just ready for war, he's excited for war. In fact, he's really wanting it to come. It's like, why, why is this taking so long? I mean, okay, could, could we get to it? And that, that's part of the fun of his quotes is he has an attitude that I would say, if we could bottle that and stick it into our spiritual life, it'd be something very special. If you've ever heard uh, Steve Irwin, remember the crocodile, is crocodile hunter? Was that, no, is that the, what his nickname was? Okay, so Steve Irwin, and if you've ever seen him, you sort of like him, just, you know, there's no arm twisting. He's just a very likable character. And uh, so we had to go back a few years because he passed away in one of his grand adventures. But the one thing I could always say about Steve Irwin is he had something that every Christian needs. When he would look at an animal, he would get so excited. And when he would talk about it, I mean, this thing that none of us would ever think twice about, and that was the way I was. It's like when I first saw it, it's like I would not be interested in whatever creature that was at all. I would have no interest. But because he was so interested, I found myself interested. And it was like, and what I'm thinking is there must be something extremely fascinating about that because this guy is so overjoyed to be able to be near it. And what that does is his enthusiasm sparked a fascination or even an enthusiasm in me. And I've oftentimes said, what the church of Jesus Christ needs is Steve Irwin's. We don't just need people that go out, you know, onto the street corner and go, Jesus, Jesus died for you and, and you're a sinner and you need to repent. And you, know, it's, you can say all sorts of truths, but why would anyone want what you have? You're rather miserable over there, right? In other words, what we should have is something that causes the world to say, what do they have? Because we are so full of joy. You need to know what I know. Have you seen what I have seen? You see, if you have that Steve Irwin contagion, it changes the world. You see, John Lucy, when you're around a soldier that is like itching for battle, it does something to you. And what's going to happen, the BEF, is this. You're going to see this contagion of enthusiasm and excitement for battle. And if you don't have it, you're going to be wondering what's wrong with you. As opposed to being in a culture like we have, which is like, oh, I don't want to do that. No, I fear that. Fear is now the normal thing. Ever since COVID-19, fear is now cool and hip in our culture. You go back to this time period of you're the fearful one, I mean, you're not going to last long. Okay? Fear doesn't play a role in this. You can't. That's not your motivation. It's like the fun. To them, if, if I, in fact, if I was to describe it, it's the romance of war. These guys romanticized what it was going to be like to have an adventure on a battlefield. I don't know how many of them had ever faced machine gun fire. See, when, when they were in the Boer Wars, which a lot of these guys were, they didn't see some of the things they're about to run into. And so what would have been called the romance of war and what you see in this boyish excitement is going to have the sheen knocked off of it. But it is interesting because if we could bottle up what these guys have into our spiritual life and get in excited about the fact that there's a fracas up ahead, that there's going to be a challenge up ahead, but we, we're the BEF. That's exactly what he's thinking. We are the most well-trained military system in the world today. Now, you could say, is that true? Probably. It's only 70,000. The, the military power of Germany swamps the 70,000 uh, in the BEF, right? But if you were to go pound for pound, inch for inch comparison, the BEF is extremely impressive. Most of them are going to be wiped out in the very beginning of this war, which is a sad statement. But to start out the war, pound for pound, they're a very impressive lot. And when you have that sense going into battle that we're an impressive lot, just as, as believers, like, we have Jesus. So John Lucy says it this way. The British Army in 1914 was more used to battle than any other nation. It possessed the highest and bravest traditions that can be engendered in a fighting force, and its experience of wars with such, was such that our own regiment, though a young one in the army, had so many battle honors that they were difficult to memorize. Our reservists came streaming in to make up our war strength, cheerful, careless fellows of all types. 
some in bowler hats and smart suitings, others in descending scale down to the garb of tramps. Soon, like us, they were uniformed and equipped with field kits, and the change was remarkable. Smart sergeants and corporals and beribboned veterans of the South African War hatched out of that crowd of nondescript civilians and took their place and duties as if they had never left the army. They were an excellent lot, but their numbers increased our strength to an uncomfortable extent. He thought that 70,000 was an uncomfortable extent. It's like, hey, we were fine, right? Hey, we had enough. And yet you're going to bring all these reservists, all these old soldiers are going to come in. Now, as I read that, there's, there's, I, I really like it. I really like that quote because I picture all these guys that have sort of retired from the military, but now their nation is calling on them. And even though they, were, you know, they come in with their bowler hat, they take it off and they stick on their field uniform. And they transform. What, how did he say it? He said that they hatched out of that crowd of nondescript civilians, like these sergeants and corporals hatch out of this nondescript crowd. I've had these moments where, in a sense, most of my spiritual life has been in a field uniform. I, I don't get to take it off oftentimes. It's like battle, bomb, blast. I don't get that retired feeling. And yet I have had seasons where the intensity lessens and I feel like I'm probably wearing a bowler hat, okay? It's like, compared to what I was in, it's like, this is actually really nice. I even have that thought, which is a dangerous thought to have, right? And I'm like, this is very pleasant. And then something will happen, which is like a fresh commission to me to remove my bowler hat. And it's interesting because when you have the war swagger in your soul and you're called upon, it is almost like a smirk. It's like, gotcha. And you know that God knows, you both have a shared understanding that you've been here before. And you know, as the soldier, he's gonna come through for you. And you're actually sort of excited to see how it's gonna turn out. Even though the situation causes everyone else around you to melt, you have a confidence in it. Why? Because you've tasted war before. You're a seasoned veteran. Now, Unfortunately, you can't fast forward becoming a seasoned veteran. Wouldn't that be nice if you could just sort of take a pill and become a seasoned veteran in spiritual war? But just knowing that it's possible gets you sort of excited. In other words, to know that even though you could be wearing a bowler hat right now, if a crisis comes that you are ready to hatch out of that uh, bowler hat into your soldier uniform, you are ready to fight at every turn. So now they've crossed over the channel, and they're making their way to Mons. They're right outside of Mons, and he's recalling that memory. We swapped news with the nearest men in the ranks and learned that nothing exciting had happened in the, to the battalion in our absence, except that a line of trenches had been dug as a defensive measure about a mile behind, and then abandoned on the orders of a staff officer who wished the battalion to move forward toward the town of Mons, now visible through the slag heaps of many mines on the right front of the marching regiment. This dirty-looking factory town had no particular interest just then for us until suddenly, above the sound of the tread of our marching feet, we heard the booming of field guns, a queer, thrilling, and menacing sound about which there were many conjectures. So if you were to start hearing artillery fire, and as he's describing it, a queer, thrilling, and menacing sound, you would think, is he scared? You know, are, are the troops scared? Quite the opposite. Uh, in fact, they're hearing the sounds of war. What are they wanting? They want war, right? Now, if you notice that I have uh, some missing words in there, this is like edited for Daily Thunder audiences, okay? They're not like, it's not terrible words, but it's enough that I had to pause and go, okay, well, we'll fix that. So the most popular, this is their thoughts of what the, uh, the noises are. The most popular being that they were French 75s and that they were giving the Germans a bit of trouble. How about that? Uh, this notion greatly depressed us. Now, they're thinking that these noises are the French attacking the Germans, and that's going to depress them. Why would that depress them? Well, listen to his reason. We should really hurry up now. Otherwise, we would miss the battle. The French would get all the glory, while we, with our capacity for deadly rifle fire and dash in the attack, would miss that crowning moment of victory, culminating in a sweeping bayonet charge, relentless and invincible. The grand assault that we would drive the enemy off the field, that would drive the enemy off the field. So we, cursed, 
the French for not waiting for us. Isn't that an interesting perspective? That these guys are literally mad at the French for starting a battle without them and trying to stake claim to the glory of victory over the Germans and stealing it from them. There's a soldier. In other words, the entire perspective is a grand adventure and where you can actually get mad at the ones that are on your team because they are going ahead and doing it. It's sort of like Nathan and I going for points, right? Or maybe I should say me going for points and Nathan just trying to survive in the point battle, right? <laughs> Historic motivations for war. What moves these men? It's interesting because every nation has a different movement. You know, Germany, it's sort of like dignity, uh, re respect, uh, honor, encirclement. We need to save our country. We need to show everyone that we really are something special. It's like this strange motivation that all of us look at and go, that's not healthy. But you look at any one of these motivations. The French, I went through the French Fury, revanchism, vengeance is their motivation. We're going to get back Alsace-Lorraine. Uh, the Brits have maybe more of that pure strain that we would recognize in the American system, which is for your country, for your honor, for your girlfriend type of a thing. That's sort of how, how they function uh, there. You know, so like all the planes, you like have you know, Bertha on the side with a heart. It, they're like doing what they do in memory. And that's like classic British uh, history too. It's like to fight for your lady, you, know, you give her a rose and then you go out and duel. And it, there's, there's a motivation there. But it's interesting because throughout history, to fight as a soldier, you have to have a motivation. If you don't have a motivation, it's very difficult to face death. But when you have something that you esteem greater, worthy of the risk of death, boy, it, it can turn a, a, you know, a weak-willed man into a strong soldier. I mean, it's very fascinating throughout history. You look at and Alexander the Great, and they had a motivation that is not even on the table. I haven't even mentioned it. And it's really weird to us. It's like totally backwards. But the, the entire motivation for Alexander the Great, he would offer sacrifices. I'm not saying this is healthy, by the way, guys. I'm not trying to promote Alexander the Great. He would offer sacrifices to the god, what was it, like Phobos? I forgot what, what his name was. It's where we get the word phobia. It's where we get the word fear. But he would sacrifice unto the god fear as, and as their guardian, as their sponsor in battle, that the men would be so terrified of being shamed and running from the battle that they would be motivated to lay down their lives if necessary, lest they be shamed back home. Back in that culture, you couldn't, if you ran from battle and came back home, your mom wouldn't even look at you or talk with you. It's like the women back home would not have anything to do with you. That's, that's a unique motivation. If the women join forces, you know, with that to say, you dare turn your you know, back on your men, and you run from the battle. So fear, it was like a strange fear. Uh, the fear of shame. What, a, what an odd motivation that is. And it worked. I mean, some of the greatest military maneuvers of all time were Alexander the Great. And yet, just because something works in a human sense, there's a lot of mega churches out there that what they do works in building a congregation, and their church stinks, okay? Just because something's a mega church doesn't make it healthy. Just because you're Alexander the Great and you could take over the world doesn't mean it was healthy. Just because you're Napoleon and you took over the world doesn't mean it was healthy. Does that make sense? So success in an earthly sense does not verify health. And so as a believer, it's interesting because do we need a motivation? We do. We need something that we are living for. I remember the statement uh, says, someone said this. I don't know where it comes from. It's one of those anonymous quotes that just sort of lingers in the air. If by the age of 30 you don't have something worth dying for, you don't have anything worth living for. Now, whether or not that is verifiable in Scripture, like, where does it say that? It is an interesting thought, because I remember as I was going through my 20s, it's like, do I have something worth dying for? Because truly, when you have something that you're willing to lay down your life for, it does give you a sense of purpose. It's like, I understand value of what matters. You know, to the French, it was getting back Alsace-Lorraine. That is what they were living for as a nation. For Germany, it was dignity and respect as a nation. I mean, what a weird thing that is. We look at it like, what? As a believer, we have something that is moving us. And you could simplify it by saying the glory of God. You could. 
but that you desire to reveal him. You desire to know him, to be known by him, to reveal him. It's this interchange that transforms us and makes us dangerous to the devil. When we are awakened from our self-stupor and we begin to live outwardly for him, uh, 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 red alerts go off in hell. There is nothing more dangerous to all of hell than a Christian that truly has a purpose and they know why they are here. They are the most dangerous of soldiers. So I, I think I brought this word up uh, last go around in the, Latin, in the French Fury. It's a French word, cran. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly. That's how I would look at it on the screen and say it. But every time the French take a word, they always say it weird. And so what's funny is I tried to look it up because it's not a normal word. I don't know if this is like one of those words that you go back. You know how they have an old word from old France? But it wasn't like it just came up. If I said define uh, cran, it, it was some kind of British word of a hull of fish. And then I also got uh, the mispronunciation. Like if say you had a box of crayons and you took one out and it's a crayon, right? It's like, okay, yeah, uh, that's not how you spell it, but that, yeah, that's good, that's good. And so this definition is not that easy to come by. However, I've had multiple people as I'm studying World War I bring it up. It's what the French valued as a chief aspect of a soldier, and that is crayon. It's interesting because the ancient soldiers, they had a value system, again, if they were measuring soldiers of what they wanted in a soldier, and the main thing they wanted was André. Uh, and Andrea, I think, is probably how you say it, but that feels a little weird if your name's Andrea. You're like, what, did he just say my name? And that's what's weird. If you look up the name Andrea, it means manful. Okay, that's, uh, that's interesting. Uh, <laughs> In other words, it's a very strong word. It's a military idea of actually playing the man or being the man in the moment. So when all hell breaks loose, Andrea stands up and refuses to back down. Andrea would be the concept of the, uh, of the bomb or the, uh, something flying at you, like some debris, like a rock being catapulted towards you, and it's headed straight for you, and you don't move even, you don't flinch. You have perfect confidence, and even if it hits you, it doesn't matter. You're showing Andrea to your troops. Remember the French uh, general staff would stand up in the battle with their white glove and their red hat, which I found out I was pronouncing wrong. It's, what did I say, Kepe, Kepis? Kepe? I don't know how I said it, but it's Kepi. See, now it's some fun people are like, good, good. It's like amen. I got an amen to that, uh, too. <laughs> but Cran translates to the French, at least in 1914, is guts, Andrea, which is where the Greek word comes from, andrizomai, which is what Paul is going to use in the New Testament to say, be the man, or play the man. This is actually the word. In the Old Testament, you know what that comes from? If you were to take it from the Septuagint and translate it backwards into the Greek uh, Hebrew Old Testament, you would end up with the same word. It would be, be strong and of good courage. And many of you know that scripture, right? That's still Andrea or Andrizomai in the Old Testament, uh, if you take the Greek version of the Hebrew. So <clears throat> one of the best ways that this has been described, at least to my soul, and it comes from a quote from C.T. Studd, and it's the fretting lion, that true soldiers of the cross function like a fretting lion. And it, one, you know, like the cage, they're pacing back and forth. And what are they looking for? They want that cage door to open. Why? So that they can pounce, so that they can move, so they can fulfill their purpose. Hey, I'm a lion. I'm not meant for a cage. And that's the way we are supposed to, in a sense, feel in our spiritual life. Like, God, give me opportunity. Give me opportunity to reach a soul. Give me opportunity to speak a message. Give me opportunity to stand for you. You're the fretting lion. And yet, if you were to measure your soul, you'd recognize that sometimes you're a little too tepid. You're not fretting like a lion in your cage. You're perfectly happy in your cage. Could I you know, have another steak dinner in my cage? As opposed to, this is not what I should be doing. God, I have one shot at this thing called life. Let me at this world. Sometimes God gives us a cage season. In fact, I would say a lot of times he gives us cage seasons to temper us, and to ready us. 
and he's testing our soul to say, are you ready? And we're like, uh, and sometimes we're like, you know, I just want to stay in the cage for a while. And God needs to spike us. He needs to spark something in us afresh. There is something more to live for. So uh, I had Harper uh, draw a picture uh, for this. So Harper, my uh, 15-year-old, did uh, the fretting lion uh, behind in, in the cage. So you can't see that lion pacing, but it's still pretty fun to stick a picture of Harper's uh, in. So here's the, the quote from C.T. Studd. In a time of peace and ease, true soldiers are like captive lions, pacing back and forth and fretting in their cages. These genuine soldiers are built for fight, and it is war that gives these soldiers their liberty and sends them like boys bounding out of school to obtain their heart's desire or die in the attempt. Chocolate soldiers are an altogether different sort. They fear the fray and avoid it at all costs. They are artisans of excuses, conning themselves into feeling noble for their efforts to spare themselves any discomforts of manliness. Real battle is the heroic soldier's vital breath. Seasons of ease turn true soldiers into stooping asthmatics. They waste away if their vigor goes unspent. It is war that makes this heroic sort of soldier a whole man again and gives him the heart, strength, and verve of a hero. Oh boy, that's a good quote, guys. Chocolate soldiers plant signposts along their path, reminding themselves often of their mother's wisdom to avoid hardship, disease, danger, and death. And therefore, these candied dandies consider it prudence to never pass through the land of difficulty. You see, the land of difficulty, I mean, if you post a sign and say, this is the land of difficulty, most of us will go the long route around it. And yet, what if the narrow way of the cross goes straight through that? How, how are you going to walk your journey out? And you're looking around going, God, is there another way? Because that's through the land of difficulty. God's like, I know. What's, what's your point? Well, aren't I designed for ease and comfort? I mean, there's a lot better way. I could just skip over this land. You're designed for the land of difficulty. Isn't that an amazing thought to think that God is building you to walk through that land and to thrive in that land? And to actually recognize the great secret of Christianity is not the avoidance of hardship. It's embracing the hardship with joy and triumph and allowing the grace of God to work through you. That's what strengthens you. I can measure my growth curve in my spiritual life to the hardest moments of my life. That is when I grow. When I've had to humble myself, when I've had to respond with faith in the trials, when I, when I can't see through the fog, but I believe. Those are the moments when I spike in my growth. The land of difficulty is perfectly suited to your growth. And so as a result, we don't want to be a candy dandy. We don't want to be a chocolate soldier that melts when the heat turns up in our life. We want to be like gold, that when the heat turns up, we get more expensive, if you will. We're purified. We're a better version of ourselves. So this was a quote I got, oh, I don't know how long ago it was. Not that long ago. We had a, a crisis in Afghanistan. It's not that we still don't, but... It was a crisis in Afghanistan, and the American military was trying to figure out what to do. And there was a soldier that had retired that I was talking to at the time. And this is what he said, not a direct quote, but this is a paraphrase. He said, I felt tempted to go to talk to an army recruiter and see if I could participate in the Afghan crisis. And then he's going to say, I felt convicted that I was once again returning to my fleshly impulse instead of heeding the Holy Spirit's leading. In other words, his instinct is to go to battle. Most of us would go the opposite way. We're heeding our fleshly instinct by coming up with excuses not to go. And it's just interesting that this guy's feeling convicted that, yeah, there goes my flesh again. I really want to go to Afghanistan and fight. It's like, who is that? And to him, he's just, you know, he's sharing this, you know, just, you know, contrite and repentance, like, oh, just my flesh. And it's just like, obviously, it's, it's interesting because we need something in between. We don't want to respond in the flesh, but we want to be ready in the spirit to fight a battle. We want to be ready in the Spirit, in agreement with the Spirit, to stand for truth. So here's a quote that I've used many times over the years uh, from the Civil War. So we have a Union soldier uh, in 1861. His name was Edward Hastings Ripley, and he is going to write some relative friend named William. And this is what he says. Outskirts of Baltimore, my dear William, 
I can now march 20 and 25 miles a day, live on short rations of hard tack, raw rancid bacon, green roasting ears, and cold water. Sleep out in the rain, having no more than an army coat over me, and enjoy myself capitally. And I tell you what, there's something about that quote that stirs me. Because we, you know, need a lot to enjoy ourselves, as he would say, capitally. To enjoy ourselves capitally, what do we need? We, we have a list, you know, and if I had these things, then I would enjoy myself capitally. What if all those things are removed, which is this? I mean, what he just described is not the most pleasant life. Now, by the way, World War I is a lot more difficult than this. However, what trains you for a World War I is this. It's a civil war, in a sense. Hey, take me through the civil war, Lord, so I'm ready for World War I. And that's how God grooms us. You see, sometimes we have to let go of the comforts in our life. We have to allow God to test us. We have to allow things to not be in our hand. We have to allow, in a sense, that pillow to be removed and just a hard rock to be there for a season where we learn to rejoice in that. And we start to enjoy ourselves capitally without the things of the world. When Richard Wormbrandt talks about preparing for persecution, he gives some, and he spent a lot of years in uh, being tortured under the communist regime. One of the pieces of advice he gives, he says, this is what I do. When I come to America and you have so much, it could oftentimes diminish your readiness to suffer. And so he says, I go into a grocery store, and you guys have so much food, so many choices. And I walk through the grocery store, and I look at things, and I say, I can live without that. I can live without that. I can live without that. He goes through the whole store, and it's like, that's his spiritual exercise. I can live without all of that. Most of us have the opposite problem. We walk in, I need that. I must have that. And that is the problem with the North American culture right there. Materialism is how it's typically described, but it's actually a flaw in the system. It's not the way God designed us, is that we have to have certain things. If you don't have the latest iPhone, you cannot function, especially when your friend does have it. And their phone is probably better now, their camera system probably better than yours, even though yours is better than 99.9999999999% of all the cameras that have ever existed in history, right? But that's not good enough for you. In other words, it's that drive to have, to quell the need, as opposed to the opposite, to say, God, you are enough. And I'm not trying to say that it's bad to have an iPhone. I'm not saying that it's bad to go to the grocery store and get some cereal off the shelf. That's not, it's not the opposite that is true. It's the willingness to pull a Edward Hastings Ripley in your spiritual life and allow things to be removed for a season if necessary, to train you that you can be a soldier and that you can live as God intended you to live. The strange behaviors of God's missionaries, they laugh at challenges and are eager to rise up to meet them. That's one of my favorite things about studying Christian history is this quality. So C.T. Studd is one of the best illustrations of it. I mean, this guy is something special. Even his name sort of shows it, doesn't it? C.T. Studd, his name Charles Thomas. Charles means manly, so his name means manly stud. Is that the coolest name? You've, and I get Eric Ludy. That's what I got dished out, and he gets manly stud. When someone says there is a lion in the way, the real Christian promptly replies, well, that's hard, hardly enough inducement for me. I want a bear or two besides to make it worth my while to go. However, when someone says, there's a lion up ahead, what do we do? Ah! And we run. And C.T. Stud is saying, hey, that's hardly enough inducement. I want a bear or two besides. If I'm going to go this way, let's make it worth my while. Amp up the difficulty. That's a soldier right there. So Hudson Taylor's invite to China's dangers. So you'll see that picture up top. That's called the Cambridge Seven. And the Cambridge Seven were seven young bucks, if I could give them a description, from Great Britain, that are all going to give up success in their lives, radically follow Jesus to China under the leadership of Hudson Taylor. These men, uh, uh, C.T. Studd is one of them. And so this is quite the troop of men. If you ever want to study something interesting, study the Cambridge Seven. Uh, spiritual lessons from the Cambridge Seven. Huh. Okay, hey guys, you, I, I've patented it now. It's, it's officially taken. You guys can't run off and do your podcast on that. You can. It's okay. Uh, However, when they get over to China, 
Hudson Taylor is going to have a need that is going to awaken in China. So he has these seven young bucks, and they hardly have gotten familiar with the Chinese culture. This is a very different culture from Great Britain. And there's going to be a need, but it's likely it's high risk, and they could lose their life in it. And he says, guys, I need a volunteer, one of you to do this, okay, whatever it was. All seven shoot up their hand as fast as they can and are looking at each other going, my hand was up first, my hand was up first. They all are jostling to take the dangerous position. They don't want the other guy to get it. Why would he get it over me? My hand was up first. Isn't it interesting? Because I would say we would have likely the opposite problem. In other words, we would, if you saw a hand shoot up, you'd be like, you'd act like your hand was shooting up. But it's like, yeah, uh, sorry, I think you got up yours before me. But my hand's still up. I just want you all to notice I'm willing to go. And then what's bad is when the other guy uh, is like, oh, that's during you know, this time and I, I can't go. And then you're like, oh, well, then Eric, you can go. Ah, no, I was just putting my hand up because he put his head up, but I thought I was going up slower than his, so I thought I was fine. In other words, this is a vulnerability to us. We are not ready to engage in the land of difficulty, but we could be. God wants to ready you for challenge where you actually relish it instead of fear it. The yearning, understanding the seemingly strange craving that Christians have for sharing the gospel where it has never been shared. If you went through my series this last fall called Daring to Do with Stanley Dale, it's one of the most fascinating things to me is that there are people right now on earth that if they know that there's a group of people that has never heard the gospel of Jesus, they cannot sleep at night. It is so hard for them to fathom, and they want to go where no one else has gone. This is C.T. Studd. This is how he was wired. This is, but this is not just a few. This is something the Spirit of God does within us. It's his ache being shared. So if you've ever studied the story of Jim Elliott and his buds, uh, that's sort of a fun picture of it. Jim Elliott's the one on the far right. Yearning, longing, pining to speak to the Aka Indians, reach them, communicate to them the love and hope of Jesus Christ. If you study the story, these guys are giddy with excitement when they finally discover this. It's the most dangerous you know, tribe anywhere. I mean, they've been warned. These guys will kill. And they like laugh back. It's like, yeah, but they need Jesus. And then they finally get the encounter. They are so exuberant, so excited. They're singing songs. And they all die. And yet, many of us have been greatly impacted because of their enthusiasm to go. Their eagerness to go impacted many of us. My life was greatly impacted by the life of Jim Elliot. C.T. Studd is on his deathbed. He is racked with disease. He's been in interior China. He's been in interior India. He has experienced hardship, 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 seeing the faithfulness of God, and now he's basically at home and he's preparing to die, even though I think he's like 54 at the time. Yearning, longing, pining to go to the most dangerous place on earth to reach a people that had never heard the light of the gospel. David Livingston gets back from his you know, adventures in Africa and rumor passes to C.T. Studd that they're unreached in interior Africa. And here he is, he's on his deathbed and he raises his hand to heaven. This is a you know, paraphrase of the quote. Lord, don't send a young buck. Send me. I want to go. Let me take the gospel to that people. You're dying. He couldn't get approved by the missions board. Why? Because he couldn't pass the physical exam. And so he decided that he had a mission society of one. His name was God Almighty that was sending him. And he went. 20 years later, he had totally transformed modern missions. It's an extraordinary story. But that is a man that has something that we need. The seed of the church You've, you've heard it said, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. So I'm going to say it a little differently. The seed of the church, when the saints sacrifice their lives willingly, there is something about it. Like when you see soldiers do it in battle, it is so awe-inspiring to a nation. And those become the, the legendary stories of the men that went over the top and did such and such. But in the church, we celebrate the Christians that go over the top. Do you guys know what it means by over the top? Have I explained that yet? That's coming out of your trench into no man's land, enemy gunfire. It's a very hard movement, if you could say it that way. But the Christians that go over the top to face the land of difficulty, no man's land. 
That's the inspiring stuff to us. That's the stuff of legend to us. The question is, are there any in this generation that are willing to be the stuff of legends? That would have been a good title for this one, the stuff of legends. I like it. Sometimes I come up with better titles after I'm done. John 12, 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it die, it brings forth much fruit. Now, we could say, well, that's talking about Jesus. Mm -hmm. It is. I'm not going to argue that. But it's also talking about us, those that follow Jesus, the body of Christ, that when we lay down our lives, it doesn't mean we have to even physically die, but when we expend ourselves in that way, it brings forth fruit. This is what is needed in the body of Christ. This is what's always been needed. It's sacrifice. It's willing to get out of that trench and move in a direction that everyone else is afraid to go. But you don't have in and of yourself the capacity to do this. You can esteem it, but then when you dig in your pockets, you're like, God, I just don't have it. I really like it. I admire the men that, and the women that have done this, but I don't have that. And he could look back at you and say, but I do have it. And it's been made available to you. So, and I've asked you guys this question. What is your position? In Christ. So in Christ, do you have in your own pockets that which you need to be self-sacrificing in battle, to face death with boldness and cheer? No, you don't have it. But do you have it? How do you have it? You have it by faith in Christ. You see, by faith you have accessed something that is not yours inherently. In other words, you don't have it in your own human skin. You have it because of faith. You reckon it yours, and you have that for the battle in which you face. Land of difficulty right in front of you, you don't have it in your own pocket, but you have it. You have everything you need to not just survive it, but to triumph through it with joy. That should get you rather excited, guys. Mark 8, 35. Whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. Acts 21, 13. What do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? This is Paul speaking to, remember Agabus and Luke was obviously there because he's writing the testimony and there were Philip and his daughters were there. And Agabus takes Paul's uh, belt and ties him up ties himself up with it, says, such will happen to the man whose belt this is if he goes into Jerusalem. And everyone starts pleading with Paul not to go. And Paul is going to be used by God to teach the New Testament church this entire idea that we're talking about. Because innately, we don't understand this. It like seems foreign. When the Messiah comes, he's going to conquer everything, and all difficulties should be removed. Wouldn't that make sense? Instead, Paul is, seems to be used by God to train the church in what we could call the doctrine of suffering, or how to walk through the land of difficulty. Because we have Christ, we're thinking Christ's resurrection should equate to, you know, the, the Gandalf, you know, where he just like holds his scepter and pff, knocks over all the enemies, they're just like gone. It's like, yeah, that. Instead, it's like, no, you actually need to walk this. Every inch of it. Well, God, why, why would we have to do that? It's hard to just plant the understanding in you, but you'll understand as you go, this is what the saints need. And through your response to that difficulty, the world will be changed. The great impact of the church is not just the words we speak, it's the life we live when we're facing difficulty. That's our stage. When we face challenge, watch us, world, and you will see the kingdom of heaven. You will the cross will be revealed afresh in and through us. Whoa! You need something beyond what's in your own pockets for that, but you have it. So Paul says, what do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Is that the quote of your heart? Is that what you're saying? I'm not just willing to be bound. I'm willing to die for Jesus Christ. You see, Peter said the same thing and then failed. Just to be loud and obnoxious you know, with you know, your boastful statements, I will die for you, Jesus, isn't what we need. Because that's digging in your own pocket oftentimes. But if you're digging in his pocket, you have everything you need to be bold. You don't need to brag about it. You could just say, yes, Lord, I will follow. I'm ready. I'm ready to get out of this trench and run towards that enemy line. 2 Corinthians 12, 10, I take pleasure in infirmities, says Paul, 
in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses. I don't know how many of you have ever thought about taking pleasure in infirmities, reproaches, needs, persecutions, distresses, for Christ's sake. Why? Why, Paul? Why do you do that? For when I am weak, then I am strong. You want to be strong, all right? Then learn to take pleasure in these challenges, in these weak points, these dependencies. God, I can't do this without you. Oh, that's good. That's good that I see that because now I can be strong in you. You see, when you embrace that weakness that is inherently yours, then you actually are able to grasp the strength of heaven and live in a way that otherwise would be impossible. Father, we want to be veteran soldiers. But to become a veteran soldier, you need to be the new recruit too. And Lord, some of us need to experience that gunfire for the first time. But Lord, each of us in here is being groomed and being built to have some gray hair on our soul that when the call to war comes, the clear invitation to battle comes, we are ready to remove our bowler hat in a second and put on our field uniform. Lord, we are ready in you. Lord, may we remember our secret of strength here is not our own determination and growl. It is yours. And so, Lord, we look to that today and say, please, increase within us. We need more of you. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.